Glenn Rhodes is a family farmer up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, one of the prettiest places uh, in this country and on earth, in my opinion. Um, I first met Glenn through the uh, Biodiesel Forum and the InfoPop Forum. Uh, those of you who have spent any time on that forum have seen pictures of his canola fields. Um, if you, uh, you might also have found a link to uh, see him and uh, some of your friends, I guess, uh, skiing behind a, a track hoe swinging around. Um, Glenn has been uh, uh, growing his own fuel uh, for about seven years. Um, your family has farmed up there for five generations, 17 something. There's four generations on the farm today. So. There you go. Um, so that will get it up to nine, is that about right? Yeah. Um, I was uh, handed, able to get um, a pound of camelina seeds from John Oster, who's, I don't know if some of you know him, out, he's out in uh, Washington State, I think. And I had it for about a month or two, and I realized I'm not going to plant these. Um, so I took a little while, you know, just to have around, like 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 we do with things, right? And um, sent the rest to Glenn, and you planted them, and you got. To, and, and so the, the bottom line is, is that he will jump in, do things, make things happen, um, and uh, on his farm to help. Uh, what you told me once was the more you control things on the farm. I asked him. I said, so is, is it makes sense financially for you to make your own fuel on the farm? And what I recall you saying was. What we've learned over the years is more, the more we can control our inputs on our farm, the better off we'll be. So anyway, without further ado, let me introduce farmer, fuel farmer Glenn Rhodes, and uh, he'll take it away. Well, as Bob said, I'm Glenn Rhodes, and I live in the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia. My family has been there since the late 1700s. Uh, when I was nine years old, we did move 10 miles away from the ancestral stomping grounds. And uh, just a little funny introduction, I was born into a Mennonite family. And most people don't say, well, go down to the Lutheran farmer or the atheist farmer, but they always say Mennonite farmer for some reason when they talk about <laughs> Mennonites or Amish farmer. So um, my family is still Mennonite. Uh, I attend a non-denominational non church, so I'm kind of the, the black sheep of the family, as it were. Um, we farm about five to six hundred acres. There are seven families making a living off of our farm. So what I'm telling you is not theory. We actually make a living farming. And so what we have to do has to work or we have to do something else. Um, it's one of those things. Alternative energy has been a, a hobby of mine and a passion for a lot of years. And uh, I enjoy tinkering. Uh, so a few things uh, about on-farm production. Um, no man is an island so even if you could make all of your own fuel and the economy went bad you still have to interact with the society around you so there's really no way you can be a hundred percent self-sufficient all the time and that's why communities form governments form so we can all work together so there's there's no such thing in my opinion as being a hundred percent self-sufficient you can be more independent or less independent but i don't think there's ever the true goal of being a hundred percent independent uh, so my little topic is going to be about what we do. Uh, I have no hard data per se. Uh, I'll answer any questions to the best of my ability. Um, my topic is, so you want to grow your own fuel? And I say, don't do it. Now I'll take questions. Um, and I, I had that in the slide, but I took it out. So it is doable on a farm scale. Uh, people talk about the, the scale of economy. I like to talk about the economy of scale. I think there's a sweet spot on the low end and a sweet spot on the big end, and we can't do the big end. And so if you can do something on a small scale often with your own labor and your own time, it, uh, it makes sense. Um, we have a fair amount of equipment that needs to be fed and cared for. Um, everything on there is diesel powered. There's actually two tractors that are missing since we did this photograph. So we have a fairly big fleet to fuel. We don't make all of our fuel, but we make a good percent of it. Uh, down on the end, there's some big equipment we do custom harvesting with. One machine will burn 30 gallons an hour, and so I don't feed that thing. You know, that, that goes down the road, harvest other farmers' equipment or other farmers' crops. Um, On-farm energy is nothing new. Um, it's been done for generations. We've gotten spoiled with cheap uh, energy. My dad said 30% of their crop production 
went into maintaining the, the horsepower. Uh, this is a neighbor of ours, they did a demonstration, that's a recent photo, and those big horses eat. Um, again, on farm energy, nothing new. Uh, a lot of people built farms on streams and they ground their own and worked for their neighbors. Um, on our farm, we've used all these crops as energy, barley, corn, uh, canola, firewood, um, soybeans. So there's energy all around us if we extract it. There's my dad, he's 85 years old, still cuts firewood. Uh, more on farm energy, it's right, right on the farm. Uh, my interest in energy has been lifelong. This was my first biomass burner. This burns shelled corn. If anybody remembers $2 shelled corn, uh, it was a good energy source. Uh, and the fuel food thing, you could eat it or burn it. And that's, that's a beautiful thing about some of these crops. They can go into either sector. You can go into food or fuel depending on the economy. Um, the manufacturer of this burner was out of Canada. And if you put your phone number on something, I will call you. And so. <laughs> I learned to know the R&D guy in the back of the shop that built these things and uh, he started importing oilseed presses on a, as a side thing and he said, you ought to get an oilseed press. And so that was my long slide downhill. <laughs> <laughs> this is another alternative energy project. This is a 30,000 square foot building. Uh, here in the front, these are radiant hot water tubes and the corn burner was supplying heat to this building. Very energy intense, the temperature needs to be in the mid 90s, uh, eight times a year in there to start small turkeys. Um, after corn went nuts, um, some people can blame it on fuel, but I say it's just the corn price went up because of energy going up. Uh, we replaced the corn burner with a wood chip burner. This is a biomass burner. Uh, these are reclaimed pallets. I have a cousin in the business and they grind all their pallets that are not refurbishable. So. I pay about $600 for a tractor trailer load of wood chips and burn it to heat the water and works well. Um, this is just again to show I'm interested in alternative energy. This is a, a poultry litter burner. It was one of the first ones to hit a farm. It's a pilot project. This is the only uh, grant money we've taken so far. That's it's a, a what type of burner? A poultry litter burner. Oh, okay. the, the bedding and waste out of the barn okay. can be burned in there directly combusted <coughs> for heat. And then the ash comes out as a high value, uh, about $600 value per ton in nutrients. Uh, this is all in early development. This unit still smokes too much to suit me and probably the regulating authorities we need to do emissions testing and submission down the road. We're on a temporary permit. It's an ongoing project. Just throw that up. And being the chronic tinker, uh, about 10 years ago, I tried to build my own litter burner and uh, I was, I just love building stuff and messing around. So that's what this was. Sorry, was, was that a successful burner or an unsuccessful burner? <laughs> um, it, it burned successfully, but it still made enough smoke that I kind of gave up on it. And uh, okay. but basically, that's, that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah, it's supposed. Yeah, huh. uh, there's a, a chamber there to superheat the air, and it goes down these tubes and into the bottom. So I was trying to to make a hotter fire to reduce smoke, but that has very little to do with biodiesel, but I just wanted to put that up there. Now, oilseed crops, um, canola, camelina, Bob, there's your camelina, and soybeans. We uh, mostly focus on uh, canola because that's what we grow uh, a significant amount of. Other farmers grow soybeans, and that's not an unusual thing in our area. Every part of the country is different. The soy, uh, I'm sorry, the canola crop in our area is a winter crop. We plant it in the fall, it overwinters, and then we harvest it in about mid-June of the next year. So it is a good cover crop, and then we can double crop behind that. We can go in with uh, soy or corn after the canola. So it's, it's not a free crop, but it's, it doesn't take away from your crop rotation. It actually adds to it. Um, one other thing. When you start growing canola, your combine needs to be pretty much um, water uh, watertight. I mean, it, you really uh, need to make sure your equipment, if you grow camelina, your combine needs to be airtight. You can see how <laughs> the seeds are. Um, here's canola in full bloom. These are the Blue Ridge Mountains behind us. Uh, Shenandoah National Park is right there. Um, that's a class one air shed for those of you to track these kind of things. Um, there's my house where I live. So. Growing these things 
is a livelihood, but it's also fun. It's just, it's a beautiful crop. People stop in, take pictures, engagement pictures, senior pictures, just more of our farmland here. That's a neighboring farm. We actually rented that land and put some canola back there. This is the crop uh, in the fall. Uh, there are a few weeds around here. When we typically plant this, we put down no herbicides. We are conventional farmers. Um, you might even call us factory farmers. We produce a fair amount of product, but there's, we try to be somewhat environmentally conscious. We try to reduce herbicides, uh, use cover crops, uh, things that make sense. Uh, one thing about planting canola in the fall, even with, their, with weed pressure in the spring, it'll take off and kind of outrun the weeds. You might lose a little bit of production, but you save a lot on herbicides and, and all that goes with that. That's a, a young plant uh, in the fall. It'll, if it fills out like that, that's a very nice stand. There, it has a nice cap root on it. Those that, that are no-tillers, they use uh, different types of what they call tillage uh, vegetation, radishes and so on. So it has a nice tap root that helps um, basically till the soil or, or aerate the soil. Um, on a presentation yesterday, there was a lot of cost to show associated. This right here is poultry litter from our barn, has nitrogen. There was a cost of nitrogen in the production in your carbon footprint. If you have more resources where you're working, you can reduce your cost even further. Now we've hit the wall with nutrient management. Our soil has uh, too much phosphorus based on the Chesapeake Bay watershed recommendations. So we're currently not able to use very much poultry litter. That could change over time as the science catches up with the regulatory side, they may allow more or less. But if, if you can, if you can provide your own nutrients, you're way ahead of the cost game. Um, planting, we happen to have the equipment to, to plant these different crops. We already had the equipment. This is just preparing the, the uh, soil for conventional planting. Planting canola, it's a very small seed and this is a, a drill. Most of your large grain crops or wheat, barley, you put your seed in this big box. This up here is a grass seed attachment, very small. You only plant three to five pounds per acre. The seed is tiny and it's it's difficult to get the seeding rate low enough. You can mix, uh, say, salt or granules and stuff in it to bulk up the seed. Uh, we, there's a blurry picture of the seed. Um, the metering device right here, you have to shut down. Uh, you can see this device. Typically, you could even run that, that cover wide open, but we have it just really pinched down tight. And at some point, you can get grinding of seed trying to meter it out at such low, low rates. Uh, we've since slowed the drill down to half, but anyway, planting can be a little bit of a challenge unless you have grass seeding equipment. The winter, the overwintering can be a little bit unnerving. The crop looks pretty sad uh, in the winter. The, the big leaves on the outside die down. Uh, you get a lot of damage on the first leaves, but as long as the center crown is viable, it's just the way it is. It, it, uh, there, you look at that and you think, well, that nothing will ever live. So that's sort of March there? Eight yeah, that would be about March. So there's just more, um, more sad pictures. <laughs> then soon it just, it comes alive and takes off. And uh, as I mentioned, it, it outruns your weed pressure for the most part. And this is just starting to get a few blooms on it. Um, it's just a nice thing to see in the spring when things start coming to life. The crop is kind of interesting. Typically it's about three feet tall, but if you have good nutrition and good moisture, it will get very tall. There, it's a little over six feet tall on some of the top sprigs. The stalks, or if they have nutrition, are very, very big and healthy. Uh, as far as planting uh, population, I'm told that the, the plant is very forgiving on population. If there are a few plants, they bush out and, and cover more area. So your seeding rate is not terribly critical. You don't want it too low or too high, but there's uh, 
you have a wide range of, of, of error if you if you mess up planting the crop will tend to take over and, and take care of itself the little flowers on top form on the end of what will eventually become a seed pod so you can see down here this pod is already formed and up here it's still making seed pods that creates a challenge when it comes time to harvest what will happen the the lower seeds will mature and get brittle before the top seeds dry down enough and if you have no way to dry the seed you really need to get it dry before it goes into storage or it will mold and heat um, there are ways around that um, this is the crop in uh, full seed pod form uh, the flowers are going about ready for harvest a few more weeks here maybe um, there again just showing the the vigorous crop that's very good stand right there and that's me right there so it gives you an idea of the of the potential of the crop they don't shatter uh, the older seed pods they don't shatter they will shatter that's that's the uh, dilemma when it comes to harvesting if you do direct cutting I'll talk about that in a minute or two there's a, kind of a, again a picture of the seed pod it's a little bit blurry but that's what I had to work with um, here again the seeds are in a little vertical or they're just in a single file row and there's just millions of seeds um, I want to talk a little bit about nutrition uh, in the biofuel business we're all looking for the magic plant we want camelina jatropha or algae whatever and the the goal is like well, this will grow in marginal land well canola will grow on marginal land too see it right there yeah. this <laughs> these plants were probably a hundred feet apart I'm not joking in the field that was right out by the edge where there was a driveway so even if your crop will grow on marginal land if you want good yields you still need nutrition and moisture and there would be some value in growing on marginal land if you get marginal results then you still have results so there's there's no bad way to do this but if you want to produce a fair volume you need decent land and decent nutrition uh, back to the harvesting thing as the seeds mature you need to pick a time and we go in and this is called swathing this machine cuts the stalk and lays it on a windrow and what that does it stops the development of the plant and it all dries down at the same time so the the mature seeds at the bottom have not shattered out and the seeds at the top even if they're slightly underdeveloped they will dry down and when you harvest it you have a moisture content that you can deal with we've since added a bin floor where we can aerate the seed so it's not quite as critical another thing this does it gives you a jump on the harvest season if you want to double crop behind here you can pick up a week week and a half of growing season by getting this crop on the ground you Canadian farmers typically I think even swath uh, grain and so on because your growing season is short um, that swather is unusual in our area but we already had this equipment for some of our custom harvesting so there again every situation is different if you had to go out and buy all this equipment it wouldn't be practical but we already had it there's our best crop we ever produced it was about 58 bushels to the acre we probably had closer to 65 or 70 but I will show you in a little bit some of the challenges with crops um, just there's those are windrows and they are they're pretty good sized windrows there there's the machine just simply a cutter bar and uh, a draper belt that pulls it in and puts it doesn't crimp it or anything like hay equipment and just a fun note Cyrus McCormick that developed the Reaper invented or designed the little cutter bar system and that happened about 50 miles from our farm and the actual bar itself the cutter teeth um, was manufactured in the town of Port Republic where I lived. He was having trouble and this guy had this water powered slide hammer. So he rode his horse up probably 40 miles to get the sickle bar made. So this technology is really close to home. There is the seed on a windrow starting to dry down. How long do you keep it on the ground? Uh, typically about a week and a half. Uh, this slide um, is kind of interesting the crop back here is still standing and my nephew had cut some this is on a windrow and it rained and rained and rained and rained so we ended up and I'll show you that direct cutting this and then we had some windrows here so it just it shows both techniques right there of leaving it stand and come in later with a combine and cutting it directly off the stalk 
Um, there's direct cutting. Um, the unit just takes the whole stalk right as it stands and, and runs it through the machine and thrashes out the seed. Is that a special combine? No, it's just a conventional John Deere. Any combine will work. Uh, the only thing that we bought in addition to our existing equipment was this head right here. It's called a pickup head that goes on a combine. It picks this windrow up after it's it's on the ground. So um, how did the uh, rain affect the drying of the, that issue of windrow? It delays it. It doesn't damage it as much as you would think, but it can lead to a little bit of shattering and so on because the seeds get more brittle as they go through a drying cycle. But it's not as it's not as bad as you would think because when it's raining, you're just you just feel all sick inside. But then sun comes out and pretty soon it's dried back down decent. Uh, the little teeth right there rotate on that belt. That's the pickup system. Well, it looked like it was elevated off the ground, sitting on the winter on top of the salts that were. It does. Uh, in our area, that's how we do it. I understand in some areas where you have a lot of wind, they will literally take a roller and mash that crop down into the standing stalks to secure it in place. Uh, the Canadians might know that. Um, that's my nephew, and whenever I say I, it includes that boy right there and lots of my other family. So I don't do this myself. It's a family project, and the, the alternative fuel is kind of my baby, but I have lots of help doing it. There's the seed coming out of the combine into a um, truck. Just my, go. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. How many acres? We typically plant about 60 acres of canola. And how many acres is your farm? In we have about 600 acres of tillable farmland and we could do more we could do less it's uh, I don't know it's just a number my brother kind of does a crop rotation and um, I will talk about crop rotation since it came up they tell you not to plant canola more than every four years on a piece of ground uh, that's to reduce the disease pressure but I can tell you the first year we had all of them we had the I'll show you some we had sclerotinia and beetles and so on so I'm not sure that the rotation recommendation is 100% but you're better the more space you can put between crops the better you are just in the, in the nature is that straw in the background that is hay, hay. Uh, alfalfa hay and my house is right up there if anybody's keeping score at home <laughs> uh, handle it with conventional equipment augers um, I did one time open the tailgate when I should have not opened it it was a operator error so I had about, about 50 bushes <laughs> You can buy a gym membership or you can scoop canola. <laughs> um, moisture. Uh, the little John Deere moisture e even has a, a thing for canola and rapeseed. I was kind of impressed by that. And there is 8.7% moisture, which is a sweet spot. They tell you under 10%. I can tell you drier is better. Uh, this was done on, on the windrow system. And of course, the obligatory picture of putting biodiesel into the combat. That's just. Uh, <laughs> It's still a thrill, I tell you. It's, um, some of the problems with harvesting. There's my nephew taking up a seam on a wagon with duct tape. Everywhere there's a hole, this stuff will creep out. There's my other nephew taking up a little hole by the bracket up there. So you need a big old roll of duct tape and a caulk gun full of silicone caulk and uh, just wear it. You'll need it. Now, let's get back up here problems with harvesting again if you get moisture rain it, it can be a pain this is in that field i showed earlier you can see the rutting right there when he was even putting it on a windrow um there's just not much you can do about it it's just farming you wait it out um this was the picture i showed earlier swathing this i think is called lodging in the business the plants were huge and beautiful and you get a wind storm with some rain and a bunch of it goes down so it's tangled, it's, it's hard to get to, and um, it's not a real bad problem to deal with, but it's just another challenge that comes with, with growing crops. If they stay vertical, you're in good shape. If they go down, it can cause issues with molding underneath. Um, damage, there you can see some shattering. This is probably wildlife damage. If you plant a crop that's of high value, there are more than just you looking to, to eat it. There's, Lots of insect pressure on any crop. Uh, canola is in the, I think it's called a brassica. It's, it's a, in the cabbage and broccoli family. Um, here is some shattering on top of the windrow. This has been laying there. You can see all these seed pods are empty. That could, this probably was caused by a small hailstorm. So it's 
when it's on a windrow, it's pretty vulnerable to, to any type of uh, <coughs> storm or whatever. When, when the seed pods shatter, um, does that mean it just releases the seeds or the seeds are no good? Like, it releases them onto the ground, so they're just, you can't will, recover. Will it grow? Will it, grow? it will sprout and grow, yes. So do you adjust your planting based on that if you have a year like this? Do you, do you try to... You know, in terms of your seeding rate, or you just go over all of it with it, and you end up with some different places. Well, typically you plant your new crop on a different location, so oh, sure. so yeah. the volunteer seed is kind of it can be a pain if it gets in your soybeans and so on. Um, a little thing about GMO, non-GMO. We have no problem planting GMO crops. Our canola is all non-GMO for several reasons. I have a nephew that is certified organic and the stuff will interbreed with GMO really quickly, I'm told, even over miles. Uh, another thing, if you have canola ahead of a soybean crop, this volunteer canola will come up in your soybeans. And if everything is Roundup ready, it's just a pest. So we, like I said, we, we don't object to GMO necessarily, but we chose not to use it in this situation. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the food thing. More pests. Uh, this was a summer crop as an experiment planted in the spring and we did about 10 acres and i, I had a bet with uh, dr harbon's barbage at virginia state university that could get no seed and we did get about 10 bushels to the acre but canola needs cool weather to germinate or not germinate but pollinate if it's too hot the seed pods won't won't set seed but just butterflies it just looked like a a, a moving field i'm not sure what they do if they lay eggs i'm not sure what their pressure is um, cabbage seed pod weevils. Remember these guys. They have little beaks on them. I didn't notice till later that they're making more seed pod weevils right there. Um, <laughs> they eat the uh, juice out of the plants and they lay an egg in each seed pod or in seed pods. The seed pods, when the larva hatches, it'll eat about four or five seeds. Right there's a seed. It'll eat about a third of your crop. Typically, it doesn't eat all the seeds, but um, it's kind of disappointing when a third of your crop is eaten by bugs. One way you can uh, control these critters, uh, if you go in and plant the outside of your field, say two weeks early, I'm told that it's kind of a, a thing where the, the cabbage seed pod weevils come in, do their business, and they're gone and then the rest of the field is kind of uh, protected from that i'm sure there's a term for that i'm not sure what it is trap uh, cropping. Trap cropping? That, that could be uh, that's somewhat successful you're going to still lose some of that crop and not all of it um, i'm told they're very mobile and if you want to even just spray the outside of your field a lot of times they move in and out so often that you will you will kill the, the bugs during transit uh, we typically do spray for these guys, um, a parecum based product. And like I said, they showed up the first year. So a lot of these pests are just in the environment. And when you get a good host, um, deer pressure, we lose very little crop to, uh, to damage. But I had to take that picture that was looking out my house window. Uh, they do nibble on it, but it, it's not as bad as some other crops. Stem rot. This is actually your cannellina plant, Bob. Um, same disease. It's a, uh, a fungus, I believe. And it just about the time your crop is big and beautiful and starting to, to produce seed, it just kills the stem. And then it forms a little, a little round thing, looks like a mouse pellet. And that goes into the soil and next year it releases the spores out. So there again, it's, it's in the environment, lots of plants host it and, and are affected by it, but if it gets in your crop, it can really be devastating. Low moisture is good. Uh, you can spray fungicide, it's expensive. And so every year we do take a little hit on yield because of this, and we're new at this. I'm like six or seven years into this process, so I'm sure the old time farmers maybe have a little better handle on it, but these things you have to think about when you introduce new crops, you find new problems, new, new conditions. Um, this, I think I was trying to show some sclerotinia damage. Some of these are green and beautiful and some are brown and, and they're dead. Uh, and if uh, anybody wants to, I've, every, every good uh, biodiesel has samples. If um, these are the seeds, the red seeds in here are from the damaged plant, the purple seeds are healthy. 
And I have lots of samples I can show you later if you want to see oil and so on. Now, another magic oil seed crop, Jetropha. Uh, being a chronic tinker and putting stuff on the internet, got contacted by a guy from Florida who grew up in Haiti. And for a while, this was going to be the answer to all the world's problems, Jetropha, Jetropha. So he sent me about 10 pounds to crush. And I just wanted to show you what the seed looks like. I crushed this seed and got very little oil. And I was kind of disappointed. Uh, felt like I'd failed the guy. And he said, oh no, those were, those were junk seeds. I just wanted to see if they would go through your press. So I was like, oh, now I'll feel better. Because so, I thought the yield was pretty low. And uh, this is camelina, another crop. We just, the field is much smaller than it looks, about probably a quarter of an acre. Went out and hand seeded it in about uh, real early spring, just when I, as soon as I get on, broadcast it by hand and just drug a, a rake over it to, by hand. Uh, very similar in look to canola. The seed pods are kind of neat. They're little round bulbs. And just to give you an idea, that's a grain of corn. There's the seed pod. There's the seed. So I mean, they're very tiny. And uh, it was a very, it was a fun crop to grow. If you want to see the camelina seeds, this is compliments that Bob uh, brought some along. Uh, camelina, I think, probably is a, a better crop for regions where, again, you have a little less moisture. We farm in the East Coast. It's fairly fairly well watered, but I suspect if you get out in the Utah region and stuff, these crops could have some merit as being productive in, in lower. Uh, soybeans, I'm not going to talk much about soybeans because lots of people grow soybeans. It's uh, not an unusual crop. There they that's a summer crop planted in the spring and often we plant soybeans behind canola so we can get two oilseed crops in one year now this crop will push into the fall so you can't just keep going every other crop you know you have you have to allow this to mature into the fall so you can't go into canola behind this but you can get two crops in or three so crops so then by the time this is done you can then just leave it over the winter and then come back next spring? Yeah, or we'll plant a cover crop like barley or rye or something that is, is not, uh, not designed not for oil producing. Not oil producing. Yeah. And do you end up plowing down that barley or rye? Or, uh, we can do that, or um, sometimes you can kill it and plant directly into it, like no-till into it. Uh, uh, another alternative crop, pig fat. We, uh, we butcher and I boiled, rendered some fat down. Just to say I did it because, you know, it's like you're, if you're a biodieseler, you want to make biodiesel out of everything. So that was just a fun little slide. Uh, there's always dinosaurs to fall back on. I took this picture. It was not photoshopped. Uh, there was an artist put these along Interstate 81 to freak out people. And, uh, I, just, I just like it in my energy crop slides because there is always a fallback of dinosaur oil. <laughs> Okay, so you've got crops, and your friend says, why don't you buy a biodiesel press, or an oil press? And you say, okay, and it's dropped in your shop. Now what? Um, this is a little tractor, so I just want to see if it even worked at all. There's a little belt drives over here to the pulleys. We had some soybeans that had heated and were moldy, so I'm running them through the press and making some press cake and uh, just seeing if it even worked. I mean, I've never even seen an oil press before. Well, the next thing is you steal parts off of another machine and you put belts on and you, you start, um, start crushing a little more and you make a little more oil and suddenly you've got like a quart of oil and you're a big time oil seed pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, just see how beautiful that oil is. You just, uh, Bob talked about the love affair with biodiesel. This is, this is, these are exciting times here. Well, pretty soon you got a big pile of press cake and very little oil, and you realize, I've got to set up to, to handle all this stuff. This is a thing that I thought was gonna be a great idea. It is an oil-heated seed preheater. There are tubes in there surrounded by veggie oil with electric heating elements. The seed comes in the top, and I, my goal was to preheat the soybeans, particularly going into the press. Uh, it does work somewhat. The, the seed tubes were not placed very well. That was a communication problem. So we occasionally in the wintertime do fire it up just to bring the seeds up to ambient temperature before they go into the press hopper. 
There's a mechanical screw that runs through here. The press cake drops out right in this area and it's, the oil drops out underneath. Do you get better extraction if they're heated? What's the, what's the reason? Um, yes, a little bit. Uh, the, the press gets fairly hot, but soy needs to be heated to reduce. So there's some enzymes that need to be neutralized. I forget, uh, trypsin inhib inhibitors and urease inhibitors. So going into animal feed, you want the seed up to a certain temperature to neutralize some of these naturally occurring inhibitors that are not good for... For the cake, then, not yeah, the oil. for the cake, yeah. Nice. Um, you probably get a little better yield going in if it's a little warmer. And pretty soon you got a mountain of, of press cake. And I like to tell people, if you're on YouTube and you see this guy pressing oil and he's got a little pile of press cake, he's got a little bucket, he's just fooling around. Because when you start pressing seed on any scale, you've got to handle volumes of of press cake. This is soy press cake. When soybean meal is 500 bucks a ton, that's a beautiful site. When soybean meal is 200 bucks a ton, that's just a nice site. <laughs> this, um, maybe 50, 60 gallons. That's just a guess. Um, so the press cake, you can feed that to animals, right? We do. We the the press cake is is high in uh, protein. It has some oil still in it, which is okay in the animal feed. Uh, with soybeans, you need to remove the oil to feed a full diet of soybean meal in a ration. Or you can take these seeds and roast them with flame roasting. So the oil production is nearly a byproduct of baking feed in our situation. I consider the oil a benefit, not a cost. And when I see numbers where guys run the analysis and fuel coming out of a pressing situation at four or five bucks a gallon, I tell people we make it for a dollar a gallon because we're already doing a lot of these processes and the, the uh, input cost and the energy cost I, I think is really around a buck a gallon in our situation. Now if you had to go out and start from scratch I can see where this is um, canola press cake. Um, very similar in quality to soy. Um, Soybeans have about a gallon per bushel. Canola has two gallons of oil per bushel as a brown number. We do not extract every ounce of that, so we're probably getting three quarters of a gallon to a little more and probably a little closer to two gallons on canola. Um, when you press these seeds, a lot of junk comes out with the oil, so you've got to deal with it. Um, I, nothing here is new under the sun, but I've used a few techniques. Uh, there's a flex auger in a continuous loop right here has this is typically it's turned as a screw in this case I'm dragging it sideways built a little cog wheel up top these are little wheels that catch that so that drags all this crud back up and reintroduces it into the press as a way of uh, just handling that volume of stuff and extracting the oil back out of it you can settle this stuff out and you end up settling a bunch anyway because you can't get every bit out a um, little bit about the press there's uh, these rings surround a screw the little grooves right there allow the oil to to escape and you do get seed particles coming out with that. Uh, there's the screw. It's kind of a two-stage thing. It starts here and gets tighter and tighter. Then it releases the pressure and tightens back down right before it exits. There's the press taken apart. If you buy one, you will have it apart more times than you care to know. Is that American made or this Chinese? is Chinese made. Chinese. We paid about four thousand dollars for this. It does about four tons a day on a 24 hour basis. Uh, that's kind of the sweet spot in pressing. If you go much bigger, I think you lose some efficiency and if you go smaller, you lose throughput. It's just observation. If you need more capacity, you just should add more presses, I think is the way it works on this scale. Um, your little press soon turns into this. Um, we started out, uh, had oil, you now, now what? So these are all 15 gallon drums of oil, my little settling barrels. And then as you see, pretty soon you go to totes and you cut the tops out and you settle in totes and you pump here and you pump there. And um, it's a growing process. So now you've got oil, what do you do with it? Bought a, a centrifuge bowl from Simple Centrifuge. I know there's some centrifuge people around here. Uh, Notice splashing. Oh, what do I do here? I noticed splashy and I saw little particles on the lid so being the chronic tinker I made me a little splash guard this fits down inside the bowl and uh, that sort of worked to prevent splashing um, I love this picture you can see the oil being introduced uh, you can see these 
splashings come out. They're fairly effective. Um, called the guys at Simple Centrifuge and they sent me a, a new prototype they were working on. Um, built a clear lid, because I've got to know things. Built a clear lid to replace this lid and took about 500,000 pictures. I'm exaggerating slightly. One thing I find very entertaining, if you'll notice, this, this centrifuge is running that way and the oil coming out of here is actually moving in the direction, this is uh, some dye in this oil, is moving in the direction of the rotation. And I assume that the outside, due to geometry, the oil is moving faster and so it's dragging oil with the other. And so on these open bowls, if you don't get the oil to the back of this bowl, you're not gonna get near the, the separation rather than just having it come straight up and out the, out the bowl. I've taken a lot of videos and I've got some stuff posted on YouTube if you are interested. There's just a, a visual of the oil. This is water, a ring of water, the oil coming out. Um, food versus fuel. I've got a nephew that bought a small press. He is certified organic, which is not really easy to do in canola, or it's not done that often. He was selling canola oil. It's a beautiful oil. It's unbleached, undegummed, uncaustic stripped, all the beta carotene still in it. Uh, when you pop popcorn in it, it makes it yellow because of the color. Excellent salad oil. I mean, it just it makes salad even better. Uh, it does have a taste to it. You probably wouldn't want it in your eggs, but uh, it works very well. So with the food versus fuel, you can go either way on these things. We go fuel because our barn is open and we're just not set up for it. Um, I'm not going to linger on biodiesel processing much because you guys know how to do this. For those of you that hate plastic tanks, enjoy. Um, I, I got this from uh, Dean Price, he bought it, sold to him, it's a 2,000 gallon day processor, has no heat in it, Chinese sprinkler pumps, uh, they never even use it because they found out after the fact that it wouldn't work, so we traded canola seed for this, I put new pumps on it, eventually put heating elements in, I know you're not supposed to do that, um, good pumps, re-plumbed it. Is there a brand on this machine? What do you say? A brand on this machine? It was built by Dogwood Energy out of Tennessee. Know very little about them. I think they're long gone. Uh, little things like putting LED lighting behind your tank so you can see your glycerin layer when you're doing uh, two-stage processing. A uh, little side note of going to uh, two-stage processing using sodium methylate so that there's a whole debate about dropout, but there's a little test tube. Um, it's fuel. Stage, just to throw it out there for people who might be interested, um, you're doing the no titration method. Yeah, no, tri no titration. You put your about 80% of your chemical into your oil without titrating, just as it was new oil. Then you process it. You take a sample, and I do a 1090 test because the math is easy. Instead of 27.3. Yeah, so, and so okay. if I get one milliliter dropout, I say there's 10% unreacted oil in the fuel, and then you go back in with a precise amount to react 10%, if it's 20%, or two milliliters would be 20%. And so I know there's a debate what the dropout means, it just works. And it's primarily uh, then more forgiving if you've got a little bit more moisture in your piece. Yeah, if you have wet oil or wet uh, methanol, that all goes out with your glycerin on the first mix and you don't have enough catalyst in there to make a lot of soap on that first. So it's a, it's a European method I learned about um, this is just a little fueling station pump. I know that came up in some of the emails. That's uh, your redneck farmer. And I do have it bonded because you do get a little bit of static that came up in, or not bonded, but grounded. Um, methanol recovery. Um, I'm about out of time here, but meth the glycerin stream is a problem. As you know, you've seen the wall of glycerin. Built a methanol recovery unit. I have um, flat plate heat exchangers that I had from another project and I fill it a little over half full, heat it, the vapors come out, I have a vacuum pump on it, I do not vacuum to steel, I was planning to, but I use the vacuum pump to move the, to move the liquid in and pressurize to move out, so there's a series of valves up here that uh, I change to pressurize and vacuum the tank, it's just a big super sucker. Um, I don't know what my methanol purity is, uh, probably around 98%, uh, I could have put my finger on top and pushed that down, you wouldn't have noticed, but uh, <laughs> that's, that I've just gotten lucky, you know, it, it's just, that's out of the glycerin byproduct. The glycerin, this is a big mixing wagon that we mix our cow feed in. 
we take the either press cake or silage, mix it in here while it's hot, and then we can put it out on a pile and we can dip it up and add it into our rations in an easy fashion, rather than just having a big old solid chunk of glycerin. Uh, of course, there's soap. Everybody needs soap. And my dear old mother, she crochets these scrubbies out of nylon netting, and it's a great thing to clean your hands. She makes them for dishwashing, but I keep one by my sink, and when your hands are greasy. A um, little bit about safety. Uh, I like air stuff as much as possible, and I know when I say safety and have plastic tanks, you can discount what I say by about 30%. Um, put a, when I got this, it had a, an electric mixing motor on the methoxide tank. Um, this is air diaphragm pump. There's the mixer. I did not cut this, by the way. It came that way. Um, so there's ways to, to do things a little more safe. Here's a spill cleanup, just a, a grease trap from a shop back. Uh, you need lots of oil absorption around because if you haven't spilled something yet, you will. Um, timers, I've learned and bought these timers off the of surplus center for a couple bucks. If you know your tank takes 30 minutes to transfer, dial it in, you can walk away, it shuts down. Um, this is a little bit more on safety. My heating elements are supported really well on top. I know it's not ideal, but that's what I deal with. Float switches. If you have not overfilled a tote processor, you will. Um, this is just a simple movable float switch. If I'm transferring, it'll turn my pump off for me. Um, wildlife, it's kind of fun to grow this crop. Finches, um, birds nest in it. It's just neat. Uh, it attracts your nephews for photo opportunities. <laughs> um, more wildlife. Bees, bees love it. Um, wood chip filtering, I won't waste a lot of time on that, but this is my dry wash system we eliminated using water and then the wood chips um, this is sawdust go into my loader bucket change once a year to about six thousand gallons they go into my wood chip burner so there's no waste stream there um, science fair projects for your daughters uh, super deal she got a silver at this science fair uh, this year based on the litter burning project she got four awards and got to go to the national fish and wildlife foundation to present her findings on the litter burner so it's kind of it's motivating for your kids when you do something there she is giving her presentation up in dc which i can tell you i was a proud papa um fun to build stuff heating elements um, this is a biodiesel or a kerosene burner out of the philippines um, it was literally bootlegged out of the philippines by a friend of mine uh, which still amazes me uh, it's a pressurized tank. You preheat the burner. Uh, and I had to fry something. <laughs> uh, and when you take a jar of jam out of your freezer and it says KOH on the top, there's a biodiesel or somewhere in the house. <laughs> um, high school kids, uh, it's fun to help people do projects. Your your daughters have, those are my daughters, great photo ops. Um, not photoshopped, just more fun. Um, Discovery Channel got to do about three minutes on a Discovery Channel show. So when you do something unusual, and it also makes you look younger. I mean, look how young I am in front of that crop. This is my wife, Sherry. Uh, and look how young my kids look. And then the kids can drive around and buy a diesel. And, and you get tours. This is a, a group that my dad, they stopped by to see. I've done three tours already this year of uh, young farmers. And even some old folks home came out to, to see farming. Um, it motivates you. This is an old Lister diesel engine. This is an old engine. We run straight veggie oil into pump water. The engine owes us nothing, so we just feed it a soup of veggie oil. Uh, irrigation with biodiesel is fun because it's just, um, and sometimes you get recognized a little bit. This is my entire family, or my, my immediate family. I actually bought a suit for this event. I did have a, <laughs> suit, uh, a local chamber of commerce award, and then you get to hang a little sign up. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I have a bunch of junk on YouTube. Uh, as fuel farmer, if you want to see the presses run, and some other things, there's my information. Be happy to talk to anybody anytime. And I think we're about out of time, or maybe five minutes older. So I'm done. Unless there's questions, or talk to me later. <laughs>